I'm Robbie Harris, and I am the, the director of the uh, Board of Trustees for the Council, and I'm uh, very, very honored to uh, stand here before you tonight. Uh, Frank's voice is, is, is missing him a bit. He's been ill, and he asked me if I would uh, do this for him, and of course I'm delighted to do it, delighted for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it's a special evening. We have a special speaker tonight, and the topic itself, of course, is, is, is most important. Namely, the topic is the, the President's recently released and signed Nuclear Posture Review, which takes on special significance uh, this year. It's done only every four years or so, so it's uh, a quadrennial uh, effort. And secondly, it draws on the President's announced goal of a nuclear-free world. And trying to square that, a nuclear-free world, and ensuring the security uh, that we as Americans and indeed uh, our friends and allies uh, depend on, uh, partially because of the nuclear weapons, is, is a real challenge. And Ambassador Brooks will talk with us about that tonight. Uh, a few words regarding the ambassador. He is a graduate of Duke University uh, with a degree in physics. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland, its graduate school, and a graduate of the U.S. Naval War College. He served in the U.S. Navy for over 20 years, uh, served in a number of submarines, and he commanded a, an attack submarine uh, during his uh, period when he was a commander in the U.S. Navy. While still in uniform, uh, he served on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, where he was responsible for uh, nuclear weapons, uh, strategic weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. Also, while in uniform, he served on the staff of the National Security Council, again, having broad responsibilities for defense, uh, as well as uh, strategic matters as well on the uh, National Security Council. After retiring, he took on a position in the George Herbert Bush administration, where he served at ACTA, which you will remember is the, uh, the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, in which he was the Assistant Director for Strategic and Nuclear Affairs. Uh, later, moving over to State Department, he became the Chief Negotiator for the START Treaty which you no doubt know the START Treaty was recently renegotiated uh, just a matter of weeks ago. Uh, in that capacity in the State Department, he had the rank of ambassador and again was responsible for the ne negotiation of the START Treaty. With that, let me hand it over to Dr. Brooks, our Ambassador Brooks, whom we're very, very pleased to have with us tonight. Thank you very much, Robbie. Um, we're going to talk about the Nuclear Posture Review. And I have to tell you that we're going to talk about the Nuclear Posture Review because before we do, we're going to do a little scene setting. And what I want to do when we get to the review itself is try and talk a little bit about the tensions that it attempts to resolve and then a very little bit about what it may or may not mean for our security. But let's talk a little bit about how we got here. No responsibility of the president is as important as stewardship over America's nuclear capability. Now, that doesn't mean that nuclear weapons demand a great deal of time on the part of the president. They typically don't. But when decisions are required, only the president can make them. Unlike any other weapon the United States has, Nuclear weapons are inherently presidential. And as a result of this, you will notice that most presidents, in the first few months they are in office, give a speech setting out their vision of the role of nuclear weapons as they see them. President George W. Bush, for example, spoke at the National Defense University in May 2001 calling for reductions in the U.S. nuclear arsenal and increased emphasis on missile defense. And these speeches have a tendency to foreshadow administration policy. For example, in the Bush administration, the stockpile was cut from 10,500 to 5,200 over the eight years of the Bush administration. And, of course, 
the United States withdrew from the ABM Treaty in order to deploy a national missile defense. Now, President Obama gave his speech in Prague in April of last year. And in that speech, he called the existence of thousands of nuclear weapons, the existence, not where they were pointed, but the existence, as, quote, the most dangerous legacy of the Cold War. And so he established twin goals. He said, quote, first, today I state clearly and with conviction America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. That was, I submit to you, a fairly radical statement. It has been the formal position of a number of U.S. presidents that we should someday look forward to a world where there are no nuclear weapons. But except for Ronald Reagan near the end of his tenure and President Obama, I can't recall anybody who actually tried to move the country in a meaningful way in that direction. But the president said something else in the same speech. He said, quote, make no mistake, as long as these weapons exist, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective arsenal to deter any adversary and to guarantee that defense to our allies. Now, this speech pointed the way to major policy initiatives. In it, he called for renewed emphasis on arms control that led to the New START Treaty, to a change in position on a thing called the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, and to an as yet undelivered promise to ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Testing Treaty. He called for maintaining a safe, secure, and effective deterrent, and that shaped the fiscal year 11 budget, and which included a major increase for the nuclear security enterprise and for the stockpile. And perhaps most important, his vision of moving to a world without nuclear weapons while maintaining a strong deterrent was reflected in the Nuclear Posture Review released to the public on April 6th of this year. Um, Washington has an insatiable thirst for acronyms. I try very hard to avoid it. I will almost certainly fail. So if I use the words NPR, I am not suggesting that you go out and send money to public radio. I am <laughs> suggesting a nuclear posture review because it's hard not to talk in acronym sometime. I speak fluent acronym, actually. <laughs> now, the Nuclear Posture Review tries to implement the vision set forth in the Prague speech. And it, it is intended to establish broad U.S. policy for the next five to ten years. And that's probably a reasonable level. It is, in most areas of international relations, not all that easy to see beyond five or ten years in the future. Uh, and so the president and both of the previous nuclear posture reviews looked kind of in that time frame. <laughs> now, there were similar reviews by the Clinton administration in 1994 and by the George W. Bush administration in 2001. Those reviews were a little different. They were generated entirely within the executive branch, and they were primarily conducted by the Department of Defense. In contrast, Congress mandated the review that just was completed, and it mandated that it would be broader, that it would include, for example, nonproliferation, that it would include arms control, that it would include everything that you might think of if you heard the words nuclear. You can see this in both a symbolic and a real fashion if you think back a month or so ago to the various briefings. At every briefing, you saw Secretary Gates from the Defense Department, Secretary Clinton from the State Department, Secretary Chu from the Energy Department, which owns the nuclear weapons complex, and Admiral Mullen, or you saw their surrogates down the line. But it was always all four speaking, because this review impacts all four departments in a way that previous reviews have not. <laughs> Further, it is widely reported 
and I believe it to be correct, that the president was involved in this review to a much greater extent than I think arguably any previous president. The, my, I'm, remember I am out of government, I am not part of the administration. My impression of the president is he likes sort of a seminar atmosphere, he likes to be engaged with people. We saw that in Afghanistan and uh, I am given to understand by people who were at those seminars that we saw that in the nuclear posture review. Now at this point, you should start wondering, wait a minute, I just said there have been two nuclear posture reviews. We've had nuclear weapons in our arsenal for 65 years. We've had a lot of them for 55 years. Uh, why only two reviews? After all, if it was important to do it now, why wasn't it important to do before? And the answer is, in the Cold War, we didn't need a special review of the purpose of nuclear weapons. We knew what they were for. They were to keep the Soviet Union from attacking the United States and taking over Western Europe. We worried a little bit about China, but we pretty much figured if we were strong enough to keep the Soviets from doing that, China was a lesser included case. We didn't worry about what we sometimes call rogue states at all. We didn't worry about nuclear terrorism at all. Um, so although new administrations did in fact review nuclear policy, what they meant by that typically was targeting policy. What should our weapons be pointed at? What sort of things will strengthen deterrence? Do you point at command and control? Do you point at nuclear threat? Do you point uh, at industry? And the results of that, since it led directly to war plans, were highly classified and would sort of dribble out in little leaks. Let's say a little bit more about the Cold War because the people doing this review, whether they realize it or not, like me, like many others sort of of that generation, are influenced by the intellectual habits of the Cold War. So what did we learn about the Cold, uh, during the Cold War that's relevant to this review? Well, the immense destructiveness of the weapons exploded in 1945 made it obvious that these were qualitatively different from other weapons. And so a theory evolved relatively quickly, first articulated in 1946, that these weapons existed to deter war, not to fight it. We argued about that for a couple of decades before it became sort of universally accepted, but the idea goes back to the very beginning. By the 60s, we had largely accepted, that the two superpowers were in a mutual deterrence relationship from which they probably couldn't get out. At the time, we thought that was a good idea. That led to the ABM Treaty of 1972. Later, we thought it was a bad idea. Um, but it's probably a fact of life, not a policy choice. And finally, we came to embrace the notion uh, that Ronald Reagan articulated that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. So we developed a theory of deterrence against the Soviet Union. We had to be able to respond in an overwhelming manner, no matter how we were attacked, including by surprise. That retaliation had to hold at risk something the Soviets valued, not just what we would value if we happened to live in Moscow. And nuclear deterrence was not designed just for nuclear attack, but covered conventional attack on us and our allies. And all three of those have implications both then and now. The first notion led to having different kinds of weapons that were survivable in different ways. Submarines at sea, bombers that could take off quickly, ICBMs that could be fired quickly. And while that theory that we need all three of them to do that to guard against a coordinated attack has faded, the forces are all still there. The forces we have today are recognizably better versions of the forces that we had 40 years ago. <laughs> Secondly, our theory that we had to hold at risk 
what the Soviets valued led us to a fairly large number of different types of weapons, most of which had pretty high yields. And finally, the theory that nuclear weapons had to deter not just attack on us, but attack on NATO and Japan and South Korea and Australia shaped a great deal of our thinking. For most of the Cold War, all American security professionals believed, with varying degrees of certainty, that the Soviets could be at the English Channel in a couple of weeks, and only the existence of NATO's nuclear forces, which mostly meant U.S. nuclear forces, kept them from doing that. So when communism collapsed, we were left with nuclear forces designed for a very large war <coughs> with a single adversary, and we had a nuclear doctrine really quite well thought out to support that war. And through the 90s and into the early 21st century, we struggled with how to think about nuclear weapons. The reason we've had to have nuclear posture reviews is we do not have the kind of consensus that we had in the Cold War. Indeed, if you think about it, most of the 90s, the only way we knew how to describe the present was by saying what it wasn't. It's the post-Cold War world. We hadn't figured out what kind of world it was, we just knew what kind of world uh, it wasn't. So the Nuclear Posture Review of 2010 reflects one administration's and one president's answer to that problem. Now the drafters of the NPR were not just influenced by this sort of sweep of Cold War history, but they were also influenced by a couple of pieces of more recent history. Last year, well, three years ago, the Congress found itself in disarray about nuclear policy in the administration which I served, and they did what Congress so often does. They created a commission, told it to report in a couple of three years, and figured we'd worry about it then. This particular commission was headed by Secretary Perry, a Democrat, and Secretary Jim Schlesinger, a Republican, divided equally between Republicans and Democrats. And it submitted a detailed report on America's strategic posture. It was a unanimous report, which is quite remarkable, given the diversity of opinion. I, I supported the commission, ran one of their working groups. And it called for two parallel approaches. And you're going to see some parallels with what the president said in Prague. It said we needed to reduce nuclear danger through maintaining a strong deterrent. And at the same time, we needed to reduce nuclear danger through revigorating the international legal regime associated with the Nonproliferation Treaty and with other arms controls. And the Posture Commission turned out to be influential for several reasons. First, because it is a quite good document. Uh, second, because its members had a great deal of prestige, and the fact that they were unanimous, uh, I would not have bet a nickel on a unanimous report uh, at the beginning of any substance, but they were able to come to something that is both substantive and unanimous. But it's also important because almost every official who had anything to do with the Nuclear Posture Review in this administration was an advisor to the Strategic Posture Commission before they entered government. Um, in fact, I can't think of anybody who I think was a key player uh, except uh, General Mullen and, and, I mean, uh, Admiral Mullen and General Cartwright. And the final factor that, inter that influenced the approach to the Nuclear Posture Review was the confusion that resulted from the Bush administration failure to provide an unclassified version of the 2001 review. Uh, I was part of that administration, and there was no way to describe this other than at minimum a public relations disaster and possibly an international uh, disaster. The lack of, the author of an authoritative document. Now, Fairness, there were plans to produce an unclassified version. Um, the Nuclear Posture Review was completed just after 9-11, and the Department of Defense, which, remember, in the last review pretty much dominated things, was occupied elsewhere, but it also wasn't very interested. The leadership of the Department of Defense in the last administration thought nuclear weapons were yesterday's news. 
Uh, and in any event, because of the lack of an authoritative document, inattention, and because of selective leaks of the most inflammatory possible parts of the Nuclear Posture Review, uh, we had widespread missing perceptions. So what was actually a fairly thoughtful policy designed to actually reduce the relevance of nuclear weapons was perceived as increasing their role. And a president who presided over and directed the largest percentage reduction in the stockpile in U.S. history was perceived as wanting to build up nuclear weapons. So the Obama administration wisely decided from the very beginning they, they might make other mistakes, but they weren't going to make that one. And so they decided that their review would be entirely unclassified. There is no classified version of the review. There is no classified annex of the review. The 76 pages that you can get online are the review. Now, if you know anything about the way the Department of Defense works, you know there are war plans, and it's reasonable to assume that the thinking in the review has shaped those war plans. But there's no standalone document that amplifies the review. So that's sort of the history that the Obama administration brought. The president's speech, the example of their predecessor, this long legacy of the Cold War, and finally the Strategic Posture Commission. So what did they focus on? They focused their review on five themes. First, preventing nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism. And they identified that as the most important issue. That's a dramatic change from the two post-Cold War reviews and an incredible change from the way we thought about nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Their second priority was to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. security. You, know, you could have sort of predicted that one if you had listened to the Prague speech, uh, because that's clearly, if you're, going, if you're going to abolish them, you've got to start by reducing their importance. Their third one was also predictable from the Prague speech, and it was maintaining strategic deterrence and stability at reduced force levels, strengthening regional deterrence and reassuring allies and partners. We talk about extended deterrence, but in the nuclear business, we really mean two different things. When we say deterrence, we mean the bad guys won't attack our friends. When we say assurance, we mean our friends believe that we're going to have their back. The administration says it paid a lot of attention to extended deterrence. What it really paid a lot of attention to was assurance paid a lot of attention to working with our allies to make sure that the reductions that they were making would not leave the allies in doubt about our willingness and our ability to continue to defend them. And then finally, the review talked about sustaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal. Now, it is human nature to focus on what is new whenever you have a review. And if you look at the press associated with Nuclear Posture Review, that's what it's focused on. So it's important to understand that there is enormous continuity in American nuclear policy between administrations. Nuclear policy changes very slowly. The articulation may change a lot. And sort of specialists may look, oh, that's a very substantive change. But a normal person looking at our nuclear policy would not see huge changes. So let me point out a couple uh, of areas of clear continuity. First, I've already alluded to the importance of extending nuclear protection to our allies. The administration consulted extensively in both Europe and Asia. And therefore, for example, despite calls from the arms control community, which is one of the president's natural constituencies, to remove the residual tactical weapons in Europe, the review did not do that. Why? Because of the symbolic importance to the Europeans 
And I think it's very clear the administration would love to take those weapons out of Europe, but only if our NATO allies say they're ready to go. Secondly, um, the reductions in the arsenal that the review called for, codified in the New START Treaty, completed last month as well, are, are relatively modest. And they were done bilaterally with Russia rather than unilaterally. Now, if you wanted to come in and show that you were on the way to zero, you could just make a unilateral cut. The president chose not to do that, and that's an important continuity. The review doesn't say this, but it preserves a longstanding U.S. principle that our strategic nuclear forces should be second to none. Uh, that is, we can be safe at parity with the Russians here or here, but we can't be politically effective. This is primarily a political judgment. If the Russians are seen to have substantially larger forces than we are, we fear that our allies will misunderstand our ability to support them. So the review makes it clear that while the United States aims to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons, it does not intend to do it unilaterally. Finally, the review explicitly continues the so-called triad of ICBMs, submarine-launched missiles, and heavy bombers. It rejected, at least for now, the proposal of arms control advocates to reduce the alert status of forces by, right now our ICBMs are ready to launch on very short notice. Many in the arms control community would like to change that, although they don't have a good way to do it. The review explicitly rejected. It's not they didn't do it. They wrote that they weren't doing it on purpose. Now, that's particularly important uh, because the president actually advocated uh, reducing the alert rate of ICBMs when he was a candidate. And depending on your point of view, uh, it shows that the president got rolled by the permanent bureaucracy or what I believe to be a much more uh, accurate way of putting it, that with this president, if you can make a good intellectual case, he's prepared to adjust his position but not adjust his long-term goal. So there are substantial continuity, but there are also changes. First of all, this completes the shift from the Cold War by making the top priority preventing nuclear prol uh, proliferation and nuclear terrorism. So it calls for us to lead international efforts to bolster the non-proliferation regime. It calls for us to secure nuclear materials globally. You saw the president had the largest summit of uh, heads of state since the United Nations Conference in 45 here uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, it calls for reaffirmation of the formal U.S. commitment under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to move toward nuclear disarmament. And the administration sees all those as related because it believes that our commitment to move toward nuclear disarmament will aid in gaining international consensus on nonproliferation and on improving security. Now, be very careful. Nobody in the administration believes that because we reaffirmed our obligations under the nonproliferation treaty, Iran is going to stop being Iran or North Korea is going to stop being North Korea. What we do believe, or what they do believe, is that when you, establish, when you need to assemble the international coalition to put pressure on them, you're more likely to get cooperation if you're seen as upholding your end of the bargain. Second thing that changed was declaratory policy. Whether declaratory policy is important or not is, to some extent, a theological argument. Uh, because, by definition, if I declare something now, I can declare something else tomorrow. But it is seen, at a minimum, as an important example of what the administration wants to do. During the Cold War, remember I talked about Soviet conventional superiority, we were prepared to use nuclear weapons first in case of conventional attack. And since the Cold War, we've become very concerned with chemical and biological attack. And so we have adopted, in both the Clinton administration and the last Bush administration, a policy that's been called strategic ambiguity. 
And what this policy says is if you attack us or our allies with biological weapons, we will retaliate in an overwhelming and devastating way with whatever it takes. And then people ask, well, does that mean you'd use nuclear weapons? And then the speaker repeats, we will respond in an overwhelming and devastating way. The new administration policy basically says we will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states that are in compliance with their non-proliferation obligations. Now, that's compromise. There are a lot of compromises in this. It's a compromise between those who would like to see a pure policy of we will never use nuclear weapons first, we'll only use them after we retaliate, and those who thought the policy we had before was just fine. Further, the United States makes it clear that even for those states who aren't covered by this so-called negative security assurance, nuclear weapons would only be used in extreme circumstances to defend vital interests of allies and partners. And finally, the review says the fundamental purpose, the reason we have nuclear weapons, is to deter nuclear attack. And that we look forward to the day when we can say that's not only the fundamental purpose, it's the only purpose. But that day has not yet come. Now, these two changes both show the tension between the president's two objectives. If you want to really push a reduced role for nuclear weapons, you would like to see a no first use declaration. If you really worry about the Allied perception, you'd like to see no change at all, because change always makes the Allies nervous. See similar tension and resolution in the approach to the nuclear weapons stockpile. For those like me who are concerned with maintaining a strong stockpile, the Nuclear Posture Review explicitly calls for modernizing nuclear weapons production facilities. It increased the weapons budget by a significant amount. I, I have said on the public record and will be happy to say today I'd have killed for the FY11, fiscal year 11 budget in any of the five years that I ran the National Nuclear Security Administration. And it legitimizes a spectrum of approaches to extending the life of current weapons, which were designed for a shorter lifetime than it's turning out that we're going to keep them. Uh, on the other hand, it also continues the ban on nuclear testing calls for ratification of the treaty outlying such tests, although right now they don't have the votes, bans new weapons design, bans new nuclear capabilities, and limits the use of the most extreme techniques for prolonging weapons, and therefore the techniques that look closest to new weapons, to a very limited set of circumstances. The review also calls for expanded strategic dialogue with Russia and China, Changes are quite subtle, but the Nuclear Posture Review and the associated other reviews seem to me to be clearly designed uh, to be much more palatable to China than uh, the policies of the past. And we can talk in the Q&A part about why I believe that. And obviously, the review emphasizes the importance of New START and other arms control efforts. The president was faced with a difficult problem. He knew, and he said in Prague, that abolishing nuclear weapons would take decades. The exact quote was, it may not occur in my lifetime, and the president is under 50 years old. Um, and because he also knew he had to maintain a, an effective deterrence, there are very few things you can do now that actually contribute to abolition 40 years from now. And so he tried in this nuclear posture review to make it clear that we were going on the direction to make it equally clear that we were going to stay strong while we went there. Some who looked for more rapid disarmament don't like this, but I regard it as a sober and balanced approach. Much of the nuclear posture review might have been the same without the long-term vision of eliminating new nuclear weapons, but the review doesn't ignore abolition. It calls on the United States to continue to focus on preventing nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism, it says strengthen nuclear security while placing increased reliance on non-nuclear deterrence capabilities, 
It says engage a Russia as soon as New START is ratified and in force in negotiations of, aimed at achieving substantial further reductions. It says after those reductions, engage other nuclear weapon states over time multilaterally to limit, reduce, and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. And it says, do all this while maintaining a safe, secure, and reliable deterrent. Now, most of us will not live to see abolition, even if it proves feasible. I am, frankly, very skeptical that nuclear weapons can be abolished. But it's clear that in the next few years, America's nuclear forces and policy will be guided by what I regard as a thoughtful, balanced review. Nobody is totally happy with this review. Everybody can see something they would have liked to change. And yet, both conservatives and liberals appear to acknowledge that, you know, yeah, I wish they'd done X, but this is pretty good. I mentioned Secretary Perry and Secretary Schlesinger. They wrote a quite good article in Politico.com, which basically said that they really liked the Nuclear Post Review. They had two fifth-order quibbles one of which was we hadn't released the total size of the U.S. stockpile, which, since they wrote that article, we have done, uh, and, and one on a somewhat more obscure point. So nobody's totally happy. Uh, that's kind of the nature of complex subjects. But it's a reasonable balance between reducing numbers and reducing their role in security and maintaining the security of the United States on the other. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions and your comments. And I'm happy to talk about anything that's sort of, I mean, I haven't talked about New START, and I haven't talked about securing nuclear materials in, in four years, but I'm happy to take questions on any of that. So thank you very much. I, I'm not going to try to do this the way Dr. Bird does. He, he does it so well. So when I recognize you, I'll ask you to speak the question slowly, I'm hearing challenged, and then I'll try to repeat it. Yes, ma'am. The question is terrorism and nuclear weapons. I said it was really important, and it was our highest priority, but I didn't talk very much about what that means. The ability to steal a weapon and set it off but even more, the ability to steal material and assemble a very crude nuclear weapon is a fact of life. We never comment on design of weapons, what you can and cannot do, uh, but if you get enough material, the knowledge can probably be found. And so the notion of preventing a terrorist from setting off a nuclear weapon leads you to the belief that you need to secure not primarily weapons. I think most states with weapons keep their weapons quite secure, but materials. Um, this is not a new thought with this administration. Uh, we have spent, in when I was in government and in the Clinton administration, a fair amount of your tax dollars helping to improve the security of nuclear materials in Russia. But I think for the Bush administration, this was given greater urgency by 9-11. Not all terrorism experts will agree with what I am about to say, but internally, we had sort of thought terrorists don't want a lot of people dead. They want a lot of people watching. And if they use nuclear weapons, it will discredit them. It has now become very clear that that may apply to some terrorist organizations, but it does not apply to al-Qaeda, uh, which would very much like, and has said publicly would like, to have mass casualty uh, weapons. And so the president has continued the policy of both of his predecessors, by trying to improve security of highly enriched uranium and plutonium worldwide. And he uh, had a, this so-called nuclear security summit to try and generate enthusiasm from the countries that have to cooperate because 
while I think the threat of nuclear terrorism is pretty much accepted in the U.S. Uh, security community, it's not universally accepted. I mean, in part because, you know, a lot of these countries with research reactors know the terrorists aren't going to steal something set off in their country. They're going to steal something to try and take to our country. And so we have spent time on improving security. We've spent money on changing research reactors so they don't use highly enriched uranium, which is suitable for weapons. Instead, they use low enriched uranium. We've spent money on various ways of detecting nuclear materials in transit, which at a minimum raise the bar uh, and, uh, and complicate it. And what the president has said is that that's our highest priority. Now, he sees, as I alluded to in my prepared remarks, that we will get more cooperation from other countries if we are seen as meeting the things they are concerned with, which is the so-called have-not nations think that they were promised in the nuclear posture, I mean in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, that the nuclear states would ultimately disarm. And so the theory is all of this is related. We will see. I mean, some states which claim if only you were doing more on disarmament, we would do more on terrorism, are lying through their teeth, and it's a convenient excuse. And at least the president is now calling their bluff. The question is China and its future role. Um, every once in a while, states tell you their policy, and it really is their policy. China has, for 40 years, been telling people that its policy is what is sometimes called minimum means of reprisal, that the Chinese theory uh, is that nuclear weapons need not be matched one for one. You simply need to have some kind of survivable capability of what in U.S. scholars usually call a minimal deterrent. So while China has done a great deal of modernization, that modernization in terms of things that can threaten the United States has been relatively small. What they've focused on much more is survivability, making things mobile rather than fixed, uh, the so-called Type 094 Jin class uh, ballistic missile submarine, which is just now um, operational. I don't think the, the missile is called the JL-2, is yet operational. China has also um, been throwing its weight around in the region a great deal, but that tends more to be associated with conventional capability. Although the Chinese have a number of ballistic missiles that shouldn't bother us, but might bother both India and Russia, although right now both India and Russia are fairly calm. In terms of whether or not that affects the administration's arm control strategy, uh, there's a recent estimate by one of the intelligence agencies that was made public that said in 10 years the Chinese might have as many as 150 warheads that could reach some part of the United States. In 10 years, we'll have 1,550. So I think we, most people believe that we are not yet at the stage where we need to take China into account. And China's made it pretty clear we're not yet at the stage where they're prepared to play. They, they have a very ambiguous formula that says when the time is right, we will join. The, the Chinese have a very different attitude toward transparency than the United States does. The United States tends to think transparency is a self-evidently good thing. Uh, the Chinese do not. Uh, the Chinese believe that the strong power should be transparent so the weaker power doesn't misunderstand that it's trying to coerce it, but the weaker power should not be uh, transparent because it simply gives away things. One Chinese told me it's like you have a gun and I have a knife, you wave the gun around and I don't say anything. And uh, I, I think that, that, so I am less convinced that there's a serious issue with China in the nuclear area. I think the long-term security of the United States, um, there are huge issues with China, but they're more in uh, their clear desire to end our traditional dominance in the Pacific uh, and uh, I, I don't see that for the next 10 years we need to worry nuclearly about China. 
I can give you a long list of very serious, thoughtful people, many of whom officials in the last administration, who believe I'm absolutely crazy and, and would take a much harsher view. The question is, um, both South Africa and Libya had uh, nuclear programs and appeared to have abandoned them, and is there a way that we can encourage others to do that? Situation is somewhat different between the two, I think. South Africa, it is widely reported, didn't just have a program, they had actual weapons. Um, they made a decision uh, to eliminate those largely unilaterally. I mean, this was at a time when, when they were under sanctions for apartheid, but they weren't under sanctions for that. And I'm not sure the South, uh, the South African case seems to me to be so specialized, I'm not sure it generalizes. The Libyan case, however, is a combination, many believe, of good diplomacy by the United States and the uh, British, and kind of the realization that Iraq, this is, remember, before we knew that Iraq was going to be a morass, that Iraq um, might be coming to a country near you. And I think that coupled with an understanding that we do not seek to change the government of Libya. Um, all of that, and you get lots of arguments about which played the strongest. I, I think that approach is a formula. I'm not sure that it goes to the level of protocol or checklist. Um, because to some extent, they've got to be here. I mean, the most obvious case where that might work is Syria, um, which clearly is trying to do something. Um, I think both Iran and North Korea are kind of far down the road for Libya to be a good model, but it might be a good model for Syria, and, and ultimately for Burma, which I don't fully understand, but have been doing some things that make you sort of nervous. Mr. Ambassador, I'm surprised the question hasn't come up yet, so I will take the liberty of the microphone and ask it. In connection with Iran, can you make a case for a military attack on Iran's nuclear capabilities? Um, the question, well, you heard the question. Um, no, I can't, and here's why. Um, first, most experts believe that such an attack would set Iran back single-digit number of years if we found everything. And, you know, we keep getting surprised, at least in the public perception, about new facilities. Some of those the intelligence community may have known about and just kept that knowledge private, uh, but I don't know that of my own knowledge. So, first of all, you have to believe we really know where everything is. Secondly, you have to believe, and some of those facilities are pretty heavily underground, that we can go in and actually damage them. And for that, what do you get? You get um, a few years to solve the problem, but you create the perception of an armed attack on yet another Islamic country. Um, I, I once spoke to a diplomat from the region who said, you guys need to go in and do something about Iraq. And I said, and what will you do if we do? And he said, oh, we'll burn your president in effigy and break off diplomatic relations. And I think that's the problem, that these are states which could not be seen as supporting it for their own domestic reasons. And I'm not sure we need a greater fraction of a billion Muslims mad at us. So I don't think that's an attractive uh, position. Now, I also don't think my survival is threatened if Iran has a nuclear weapon. I don't like it, but I, the government of Israel is in a somewhat different position because some in Israel do believe their survival is threatened. And the question is, do they have the capability to pull off an attack? They certainly, uh, if you remember back uh, in the 80s, attacked a uh, reactor in Iraq that set back the Iraqi program for a while. I don't know. The Iranian program is much more dispersed, uh, much harder. I don't know if the Israelis have the capability, uh, and I don't know what they will do if they actually become convinced that military action is the only thing that will stop them. I'm not sure they know what they'll do either. 
The question is, um, is a disarmament approach credible? Uh, first of all, when our adversaries have only our word for how many weapons we have, uh, when um, we have certainly enough weapons that would take a long time, and I'll add something that the questioner didn't, when our ability to actually physically take weapons apart is limited. In announcing that we had uh, 5,119 weapons on the 30th, we also said we had several thousand weapons awaiting dismantlement that had been taken out of the stockpile but hadn't been taken apart yet, and there have been estimates floating around of uh, that will take us well into the 2020s. So do our adversaries find that credible? Uh, I think if you look on the time scale the president is looking, which is a couple of decades, they find it possibly credible. We will know more after New START comes into effect and we seek to move forward with something that will probably try to capture warheads, total numbers of warheads. That's the way I read the Nuclear Posture Review. Uh, and then we'll see whether at least the Russian Federation is prepared to do something. You can conceive of ways to verify that you have actually eliminated nuclear weapons. It, it gets in, there are security issues. You have to find something that doesn't reveal design information but still lets the other guy have confidence that this stuff has been turned into reactor fuel or something. There's been work done on that, and it is in principle a, a solvable problem. Now, notwithstanding what the president of the Russian Federation has said, many Russian experts are dismissive of the elimination of nuclear weapons, and they are particularly dismissive of the United States leading the charge because we are the strongest conventional power in the world. Uh, and so you have to believe in a pretty dramatic transformation of the international system before elimination becomes possible. But there are also useful things you can do over the next 10 or 15 years that don't depend on that, on that transformation. And I think the, the, if you look at the people who got abolition back in the public debate, um, Secretary Perry, Secretary Schultz, Secretary Kissinger, and Senator Nunn in a Wall Street Journal editorial of three years ago, uh, they basically argue, we don't know whether you can do it, but let's take a few steps. Sam Nunn talks about base camp. You don't know if you can get up the mountain, but you can at least go establish a base camp from which you could find out. That's the logic. I, I think I said in my prepared remarks I am a skeptic um, because I think it's just too hard to believe that all of the political reasons people have nuclear weapons will be solved at the same time. Uh, but we're not going to have to worry about that for 10 or 15 years because there are things we can do that move us in that direction in the next 10 or 15 years that don't depend on your belief that abolition is possible. The question is the Nuclear Free Middle East Initiative. There's been a resolution primarily introduced by Egypt forever at uh, the Nonproliferation Treaty Periodic Five-Year Review Conference. The uh, problem is that if you look at states in the Middle East, there's nobody who acknowledges having nuclear weapons, but there's one state, Israel, who is widely believed to have nuclear weapons. Um, the nuclear-free Middle East is a, or a weapons of mass destruction-free Middle East, has been a longstanding formal uh, thing the United States said should be considered. I think it is extremely unlikely that we will move hugely forward. Uh, what some are advocating is establishing a UN court, doing something to acknowledge that we're trying to figure that out. But if Israel has nuclear weapons, I want to be very careful because I'm government of Israel has been very clear that they are not going to say whether they have nuclear weapons. The government of the United States has been very clear that we're not going to say whether they have nuclear weapons. But pretty much everybody other than those two entities assumes they have nuclear weapons. So if they do, uh, it is because they think they need them in a dangerous neighborhood. And I don't see the Middle East getting less dangerous 
from the standpoint of the state of Israel. So I, I think that the nuclear-free resolution of the Middle East is premature until one of the attempts that every president has made, and this one will too, to bring peace to the Middle East actually works. And, and your guess is as good as mine when that's going to happen. The, the question is Iraq and, and its nuclear capabilities. The, to the extent that I understand the facts, uh, the administration genuinely believed there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, not nuclear. They believed that there was a nuclear program. They didn't believe that Iraq actually had nuclear weapons. But after the first Gulf War in 1991, we were surprised at how close Iraq had been on nuclear weapons. And so, you know, when you've made a mistake in one direction, you tend to compensate by reading the evidence in another. It appears that Saddam Hussein was so worried about losing control of his own populace that he allowed the impression to uh, go that he had nuclear weapons. In fact, we did not find any evidence of weapons of mass destruction. We did not find any evidence of uh, nuclear weapons. Karl Rove, in his recent book, has said that if he had known that, he would have advised against going to war in Iraq. Um, uh, you know, I just tell you what the man said. I, I, uh, but, but the, the, fact, the factual answer is that um, we didn't find anything, uh, and probably that has got some lessons uh, about how you deal with dictators who appear to have been more afraid of losing control of their own people than they were of being invaded. Um, as I, I'm not an expert on Saddam Hussein, but he does appear to have had a value system that few of us would completely recognize. Well, <clears throat> let me, um, in, in closing, the ambassador pledged not to use any acronyms. And as best I can determine, he didn't use a single acronym and not a single abbreviation. And that's worthy of applause in and of itself. But, but there, there, there's more. Uh, as many of us in the room know, uh, those who work with nuclear weapons and strategic deterrence, there tends to be a priesthood. And, and the priests only understand each other. Now, I think tonight the ambassador has done an absolutely marvelous job of explaining a very complex subject to us in a very, very lucid way. So please join me in thanking him. Thank you very much. Thank you all.